Namaste. Welcome. Welcome to the satsang. Let's begin. All right, I have the magic box. Crafted with great skill. And I will draw up the questions in order they are. Is the astral world what some Christians would consider as heaven? Part of it is, but of course, there are parts that are miserable. And they are hells. So it's all according to a person's state of consciousness. You see, here we're in the grossest and lowest level of being. That being so, people don't even understand their own minds. And even observing other people, you may not be able to understand their actual character. This is the problem of the material world. In the astral world, it's completely clear. For one thing, you only go to a world that exactly suits your level of consciousness. And if you're intelligent, you'll really take a good look at that world and say, this tells me about myself, because this all is a revelation of my state of mind. It's real, it's subjective, but, but there it is, you see. Even hell, you see, is better than life in this world because in hell, you know why you're there. There's no one in any hell that doesn't know why they're there. But people don't know why they're here. And they think there's no purpose to it. And even make little cute sayings about God has pulled a joke on them and that's why they're here, etc., etc. But... Uh, The truth is, uh, it's a revelation there. If you go to a really great world, to a tapaloka, you can say, well, I had all kinds of distractions down on earth and I had a hip that often bothered me when I wanted to meditate. But let's hope I'll be here for maybe a few hundred years, so I'll go into meditation right now and you can do it. Then it's really heaven because you'll make yourself a heaven. Uh, is Ma Sarda Devi an avatar like Sri Ramakrishna? Yes, this is uh, a belief that is usually held by devotees of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ma did not have a spectacular life. She lived a very inward life, a very hidden life. And really did Sri Ramakrishna. We read these remarkable things he did, the remarkable things he said, but only a handful of people saw that. They just thought he was some half-cracked pujari that was allowed to live on the property there at a corner, in a corner room, you see. But yes, she was Maha Yogeshwari. Uh, which means the great yogini, the great uh, goddess of, uh, of yoga. Very indeed. I really recommend you read her life and her sayings. They're very, very straightforward. Understand, truth is jnana. There's no such thing as devotional truth. Truth is all in wisdom. And she was that also. She wasn't just a Yogeshri, she was a Jnaneshri. And she was very open and very true. A worthy spiritual teacher will not lead you on and will not try to just make you feel good. For example, a devotee of hers said to her uh, toward the end of her life, Ma, when you've left this world, will you remember us? And she said, it isn't very likely. So that didn't, that didn't sound like a nice, wonderful quote, but she was that straightforward. Anandamai Ma was also, but people don't put that in the books. All right. It is, a, is it possible 
to move on if I lose anything in life without attachment to that? Yes. You do it by meditation and cultivating your own true consciousness, which is spiritual consciousness. It's good if you can remember philosophical principles, verses from the Gita, which help. But the real thing is your ability to do, you know, we have our American expression, roll with the punches. And that's one of the things a yogi is. A yogi is a someone who never has troubles, who never has worries, who never has difficulties, but one who can, just as when the sea swells, the boat rises right along with the wave and subsides with the wave. And this is the way we live. This is why japa is so essential. Continual japa keeps you in the boat, centered in the boat where you need to be and will keep you dry no matter how much it rains. Do you ever have thoughts, sorry, do you ever have fear thoughts about the future or anything? No. Uh, because it wouldn't do any good. What is the future of the world? Who knows? You see, people have been saying for thousands of years, a new era is coming. A new chapter in our history is coming. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. Oh, it'll be so good. Oh, it'll be so bad. And it never is any of these things. Things just keep going on. The French have a very wise saying. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, because, you see, uh, religion thrives on fear, on threats. And so also does politics. If this man is elected, our country will be destroyed. Oh, come on. We've had idiots for presidents and great wise men for presidents. And guess what? America just kept going right on. There is a poem, American poem that begins, sail on, O ship of state. But we always have the idea it, just around the corner of big change, the Lord Jesus is coming back and all will be changed. Bunkum. Ah, the astrological configuration there is going to bring about a great change. Uh, what great changes? Look, look how this country has survived two world wars and a lot of other little wars. And how much did it affect? You see, the media loves to keep us afraid. The media kept us terrified of the Soviet Union for decades, mostly because the media were leftists and were communists, some of them, and wanted to make us terrified. But the truth is they were a bunch of incompetent bumblers. They couldn't even manufacture decent weapons. For example, uh, the Soviets gave a whole fleet of jet fighters to Egypt, who was intending to use them on Israel. So they had the fighters. And then in one of these so many days war thing, I, I forget the numbers, uh, the Air Force, Egyptian Air Force ran out, got into planes, not one of them could even take off. It was junk. It was trash. Their munitions factories in the Soviet Union couldn't even produce weapons. That was the real truth. So you see, the Israelis weren't scared of Egypt. And I, but I'm sure there's some that said, do you understand they've got a few dozens and dozens of special jets and what will we do about it? They didn't, know, didn't need to do anything about it because the idiots couldn't even come there. So, understand this. That's right, the only thing to fear is fear itself. 
And just understand, you're, you're in for the ride when you come to this world. Your karma is going to manifest. It's not going to unmanifest. And therefore, know this, even if you die, you'll still be alive because only the body dies. And I mean that literally because one of the things the media did, they did such an amazing job of brainwashing, especially about atomic war. How many stories have I read about the aftermath of the nuclear holocaust? Right? They once did a poll and found that children, school children, great school children, that the vast majority believed they were going to die in a nuclear war. Now imagine having to grow up feeling that. And that was all produced by the fear mongers. So, fear not. But, I would be really scared if I didn't do any sadhana because I think, well, fool me, I'm going to ruin my life completely here and I won't be able to cope with what happens. That's, that's the truth of things. I've heard of people who became yogis who said, well, such and such used to upset me tremendously. And now I realize it. I'm still going on. I'm still surviving. Uh, I have a non-dual perspective. How do I approach worship both conceptually and ritually? Well, if you have that perspective and you consider it correct, why bother with worship? You can consider for some people that's worthwhile and for some people it's worthless. And this is true, you see. This uh, is all according to karma and samskara, the conditioning of our mind through previous lives. So don't let anyone tell you that you have to do it. It's good for you to realize that for those for whom it suits, it is good. And they are sometimes utterly worthless. <laughs> uses of even worship. So the thing is, everything is consciousness. And the consciousness is manifesting as a vibration, as energy. And in Sanatna Dharma, the worship is not like, oh Lord, I just love you and I think you're so cute. Take some flowers. What is God going to do with your flowers? Eat them? But in the, the sensible levels, and there's a lot of unsensible levels that have been grafted onto Sananda Dharma, the worship creates a change. There was a, a very great esotericist, one of the first psychotherapists in England. Her name was Dr. Violet Firth. She wrote books under the pen name of Dion Fortune. D-I-O-N, Fortune. Her book, Psychic Self-Defense, is absolutely a jewel. Most of her writings are very, very valuable. And she talked about magic, different than our Hollywood uh, concepts of magic. But she said, magic is creating a change to the act of will. That means the yogi is the supreme magician but he works his magic in his own consciousness. And that's what really matters. But these things work. We have the great Prada Pratishta, that means establishment of life at the Yodhya temple, the Rama temple. Arun Yogi Raj made virtually supernaturally beautiful image, but it was an image. But what the sages of India have understood being translated into ritual action, that image was endowed with life. But of course, it is alive. A stone is as alive as your and my body is. 
It's just manifesting differently. And the image came to life, and the image sees, and the image hears. I say that. It isn't the image, of course, just as, yes, your bodily senses are receiving the message, but that which is sitting there, either thinking what I'm saying is stupid or wise or who knows what, that discriminating faculty, that's your consciousness, and that's the real thing. So the consciousness inside that stone was aroused and Ram, who is an avatar, who is a world savior, the consciousness of Ram is there. Since his consciousness is infinite, it can be everywhere and the totality of it can be every single point at a time. Since we're not God, we don't quite figure how that happens. But it happens. And therefore, when you walk up to that image, you're walking up to Rama, you're seeing Rama, but his veil as stone seeming is there. But when he looks at you, he sees you as you are. And so in that temple's atmosphere, if your energies, especially mental energies, are subtle enough, you will encounter divine experience. And it will purify you and it will uplift you. But if not, well, nothing will happen to you. But Sri Ramakrishna one time was talking with uh, some, some of the people that came to discuss spiritual things with him. And there was a man named Shivanath who was always going here and there and here and there uh, to pilgrimage spots, always adapting some kind of strenuous or eccentric uh, discipline that was supposed to uplift, and etc. So Shivanath just came in, pranam to Sri Ramakrishna, and went off to the temple. And Sri Ramakrishna said, isn't it amazing? It doesn't matter where Shivanath goes, it doesn't matter what he does, he never changes anything. So, of course, again, it all comes back to me, to you. But never think there's not a value in something. Just because it doesn't have a value to you personally. It can mean something very, very much to others. All right. Uh, you've written that Jesus learned everything in India. But didn't he also study with the Essenes and the remnants of the Egyptian mystery schools? He went to Egypt and he encountered great teachers in Egypt. But where did the great teachers of Egypt get their knowledge? Uh, the West usually disapproves of people who dare to look to the East. And if they go to the East, well, that's an offense. And they've always been with us. Pythagoras was griped at constantly about what did you go to India for, you see. And Apollonius of Tiana, who was a great master, whose life is very valuable to read. Apollonius went to India. And he learned reality there in India, or the key to reality there in India. And so when he was in Egypt one time and there was a big gathering of both ascetics and philosophers, they were complaining to him about why did you go to India? And he, his answer was very interesting. He didn't defend himself at all. He just said, let me ask you a question. What single tenet in your spiritual philosophy did not come from India. That if you go back in your history, you'll find someone either came to, from India and taught, or someone went to India and came back and taught. So, well, what did they have to say? You see? So, what is, is, and what isn't, isn't, and blessed are they that can experience, and there 
by no, the difference between the two. Can intermittent fasting enhance meditation? Not particularly. The whole fasting and the business is utterly physical. It's utterly material. It's worship of the body. It's thinking, if I cleanse the body, I'll cleanse the mind. That's, that's silly. The truth is that there are external helps. And the right diet, and that's not fasting, though a person shouldn't be a glutton, the right diet absolutely affects your spiritual life. So if you ingest meat, fish, eggs, anything of animal origin, and alcohol, and nicotine, and even supposedly consciousness opening drugs, you're dead. You're not going to, you're, you're not getting anywhere. You don't, may not like the idea, but I don't care. And also, I don't care if you're doing those things. But this I can tell you, sadhana, supported by the observance of yama and niyama, is the only way to manage it, and the only way to get any lasting benefit. I well remember back in druggy days where the yoga boom was going on, everybody, the, all the disciples, these phony gurus, were obsessed with fasting. Or raw food diet. Yes, yes. Raw food diet. But especially fast, fasting, fasting. As if this will change the mind. I foolishly uh, made a mistake in this way. That there was one very, very special spiritual event going to take place. So I thought, I will fast the whole day. It was going to happen in the evening, all right? So except for water, El Nobilo Nirmalinando uh, fasted all day and then went to this event, which was about three hours long or more, and sat there and thought, oh boy, when I get home, am I going to have a big salad to eat? So I sat there and was hungry and thought about what I wanted to eat. So that didn't work. That didn't work. The physical can never take you to the metaphysical, but the physical, in the sense of discipline, can get out of the way of your mind and its aspiration to go to higher things. That's definitely so. Dear Swamiji, could you share with us your thoughts on the spiritual significance of the new Ram Mandir and Ayodhya? which has attracted so much attention and enthusiasm in India over the past weeks. It was a divine event. As I say, Ram came. That's why, uh, uh, forgive me, uh, my Hindi is so terrible. But, uh, you know, there was a slogan, Ayenge Ram? Anyway, it said, Ram comes to Yodhya. He was born in Ayodhya, lived much of his life in Ayodhya. Though he went into exile, he came back. He was a king of Ayodhya. At the end of his life, he and those close to him walked into the Sarayu River and merged back into the infinite. So that river is still there. And just that it's the place where he's born. Yogananda said, wherever a master goes, his vibrations remain there permanently. But of course, if we're not in tune with it, we, we don't realize it. But Ram has been in Yodhya ever since he was born there. But people paid attention or people didn't pay attention. And of course, the demonic people came and destroyed the shrine made over his birthplace where any sensible Hindu would want to go. 
In fact, any Hindu would want to go. Forget to put the word sensible in there. They're not real Hindu if they don't want to go. So, and they built their ugly thing there and did their ugly rituals. I have no apology for saying this. Don't bother to write me an email asking me how I could. I'll tell you how I could because I'm a Hindu and I know history. And I know louses when I see them, all right? Therefore, they came. But they couldn't take Ram, neither they nor these evil Christian missionaries, nor the evil atheists of modern politics, who always collaborated with the communists, in other words, the, in other words, the Congress party. They could not take Ram out of the hearts of the people of Bart. And so now it's the people themselves, it's the Bharati themselves that have got Pran Pratisht, that have a new dimension of life. The Yodhya temple means something not just for all of Bharat Varsha. It's something for over the world because Ram is universal. I think I've mentioned to you, you see, uh, uh, Krishna was born in, in a, a great a clan, a uh, group of people called Yadavas. Shortly after Krishna's departure from this world, the Yadavas all disappeared. Where did they go? Archaeologists, anthropologists, where did they go? Where did they go? They went into Mesopotamia, and after a while, they ended up in Israel. The Jewish people are the Yadavas. Jesus was a Yadava. Therefore, the spiritual roots of all Jewish people lies in India. You see? So, uh, the name, one of the names for God in Judaism is what? Ram. In English characters, they usually write R-A-H-M to show it's a ah sound. Not Ram, but Ram. Ram is everywhere. You're not going to, if you want to go where Ram is it, then you're going to have to try to annihilate yourself, which can't be done, because wherever you go, he is there. It even, you see, one of the Yadavas, David, he said, if I go to the deepest hell, you're there. If I go to the highest heaven, you're there. And he wasn't complaining. He was rejoicing. He was glad in it. So, Ram is the world world is his manifestation. Therefore, the Ayodhya temple is a world event. Of course, the intensity is there in Bharat itself. But this is really the truth. And Prime Minister Modi, who is a man of God and a politician second, He said, a new era has begun, and it has begun. You see, when people are oppressed for centuries, they get used to it. And since it's miserable, they just don't think about it. And they become paralyzed in their hearts, in their minds. And a lot of their being, in a sense, becomes numb. And when the oppression is gone, the external oppression is gone, the effect is still there. And it takes a long time for people to wake up and realize, hey, that demonic presence is left. That demonic oppression is gone. Let's look at our own country of America. Think of the hideous fact that we have slavery in our past. What a 
slavery is such a terrible evil. So what happened? The Negro people were enslaved. Some of them ran north, but then they found they weren't any better off often. So when slavery ended, all four of my great grandfathers were from the south and they were southern abolitionists and they warred against slavery. And then when the Civil War came, they went north and left their families to be persecuted and joined the Union Army. One of them was a minister. And so when they tried to issue him a gun, he said, well, I can't shoot a gun. I can't shoot anybody. I'm a minister. And they said, well, then why then did you enlist? He said, because I have to stand up and be counted against this evil. But legal freedom didn't fully work. That's why segregation, which was a great evil, prevailed for look how long. See how long it prevailed. It took that long until finally the people said, no more of this. We are not slaves. But you see, you can get it intellectually, but it doesn't always go way deep inside. And then they realize, and we had by God's mercy and God sending us such great leaders as Martin Luther King, and therefore that slavery of the mind was cast off. It just took that long. And the same thing has happened in India. It for the for the soul, for the deep inner consciousness, which isn't intellectual, to suddenly realize, wait a minute, 700 years of Muslim demons and 300 years of British demons and wonderful caring missionaries and reformers, but they're out of here. <laughs> And guess what? Oh, we're Bharatis. And if we're Bharatis, we're Hindus. And that's what we are. And so they've said, no more, you thief. Give back what you stole. It's ours. Someone tried to steal a book from me once when I was actually in the library doing research. Very interesting idea. It's a whole long story. I won't tell you. But when this character came and thinking I wasn't looking, tried, to, I said, that is mine. And he went out the door. So finally, people are vending and saying, this land is ours. And our religion is the land, is the religion of this land. We don't force it on people. That's never been the way of Sanatana Dharma. That's why it's Manava Dharma. It's human Dharma. It's a way humans should live. It's spiritual mathematics. And they've said, we've just had enough of it. And I hope and pray that never stops until that has been completely dissolved from Bharat. And it never comes back. That's the real truth. But the whole world has been benefited. If you're doing sadhana, if you're trying to elevate your consciousness, I assure you that the presence of the Ayodhya temple is benefiting you. Of course, it's, it's all inwardly. But that's the truth. What really is count is now Bart is going to be Bart, and the Bart people are going to be what they are and not think they have to apologize or explain, but say to the dark ones, the Asuras, the word Sura means light, an Asura is someone who's of darkness, who would bring darkness on people's minds, who would bring darkness on people's hearts. And they're saying to the Asuras, out with you, off with you. We are ourselves the light. This is what the great Rishis have told us, and that's the truth. 
and you're not going to veil it any longer. So it's wonderful. I have uh, in my computer already this morning been listening. I have a, a wonderful uh, video. There is a video put out that sh that is continuous music, devotional music relating to Lord Rama, and pictures of the the great Ram image. Rama as a young child, Ram Lala, say 12, maybe 13 years old. Incredibly beautiful image. And so I turn it on. And even if I'm doing other stuff, I hear the singing. And every so often, I've got to go and look at that divine face, where it is a divine face. So if you're on the way to God, a wonderful thing has happened for you. And if you're not, well, nothing real ever happens to you. My, how negative. All right. Yes, uh, you uh, put uh, the rhetorical question. If you saw someone drowning, would you wait for them to ask before you save them? And unreasonably, what are those drowning spiritually, not questing for direct spiritual experience? This was asked. This was asked, uh, forgive me, my, it's been long since I read about it. Uh, that some spiritual figure was asked, uh, why aren't you out teaching? Why aren't you out going among the people? And, and he said, why should I try to force on them what they don't want. You see, you have no spiritual life until you enter awaken. So you could read a book and say, well, that's marvelous. And you can have inspiration from external things, but they'll only really benefit you if already you have awakened. And there are people that love sleep. Oh, they'll like to pretend they're interested in truth. They'll like to pretend they uh, are uh, seekers. But in reality, their seeking is a way of hiding the truth about themselves. And they like to say all kinds of noble things. I was just mentioning uh, to the sadhus here uh, be before we began this satsang about a, fr uh, a friend of mine that I gave the small book Japa to, which is about mantra and the continual repetition of mantra. It was just a very tiny little booklet. And I bought about four copies and gave, gave them to people. And uh, this friend of mine read it, and as I did when I read it, realized this is the way to go. This is it. Not all this pranayama and all this postures and so on. This is not the way. In the beginning was the word. Therefore, the primal power is a power of word. And the great rishis of India discovered the total picture about this and handed it on to us. And so she was telling it to, of course, a person she shouldn't have even talked to. Please learn this. The people who aren't interested aren't interested and don't think you'd like to help them out because they will consider you're tormenting them if you present spiritual realities to them. Let them sleep. So anyway, she was talking to one of these unfit people, an alcohol, drug, nicotine, and sex addict. And in her enthusiasm, because she was so happy she'd found it, because she and I are both in the same yoga cult, and we'd been completely bamboozled by it and to find something real. And so she was saying, she said, of course, the really important thing you must work at is you say it always. And so he says to her, well, if it had all that power, you say, 
You should only have to say it once. Doesn't that sound gloriously noble? Yeah, sure. So, as Jesus said, cast not your pearls before swine, lest they turn around and they gore you. So it is. All right. I've had a couple of things relating to brahmacharya, and therefore, commercial time. Please read this book. You don't have to buy it. You can go to our website and <clears throat> find it posted there for free. You can uh, copy a PDF into your computer and read this. This is great wisdom and explains everything, the whys and the wherefores. So I could go on and on about it, as I have about the, the Odia Temple, but read it and see what wise people said. There's a little bit in for me, but others, including, for forgive me, even though I put it together, I want to make sure I got it. Yes, uh, there is a, a Dr. Edwin Flato and a Dr. Raymond Bernard, and their scientific medical uh, understanding has gone into this. So uh, the questions, I, but I want to say this, read it, take it to heart. And the question is, what about married people? And the thing is, married people need to read the principles and see how it can apply to their life. And I don't mean they need to try to like grit their teeth and follow a discipline that they don't feel is compatible with them. So husband and wife together should work it out. Not the husband dictating the wife or the wife to the husband. Though I find it's usually always the husband who likes to say, oh, my wife is dragging my consciousness down and blah, 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 blah. And you need to work it out intelligently and carefully and observe to see if it's working for you. But a monk has no business to sit here and tell you what to do about it. That's, that's the real truth. Uh, because first of all, part of your hostile life is having children. And if my father and mother had practiced strict brahmacharya, well, I'd have to have gotten another body somewhere else. Okay. Can you explain why cremating the body after death is better for the soul? Why is it better to cremate the body after death than to bury the body? Because, you see, we have psychic bonds, say astral bonds, to the body. And some people are so absorbed in the body that when they die, they just stay in the body. Then they get buried, and so they're buried alive as far as they're concerned. This is no joke, and it's no mythology, believe me. I've seen this in more than one cemetery. In fact, I've never gone into one after being a yogi that I didn't see it. There are people that are either, I mean it, <laughs> sitting on their grave, that is, they can go a certain distance from their physical body, they're just sitting there. Or they're down there and they're panicking. I mean, I've heard people crying from under the earth. Believe me, believe me, you can become earthbound if the body is not cremated. If the body is cremated, then it can't bind you anymore. Now, you can be bound in your mind to want to come back and live in another body, and, and that's fine. That, that's your business. But you're not free. But it will free. I remember, uh, this is very true of people who suffer great pain, great illnesses, say for a prolonged period of time, that, of course, their attention is so completely overshadowed naturally by their body that when they die, they stay what they've been 
fixing your mind on all this time. Now, I was one of the first male long distance telephone operators. And one of the uh, other operators had a, a little boy who, I, I forget if it was leukemia or what, but it was one of these painful, wasting, long drawn diseases. And he was about six years old and he suffered horribly. Well, when he died, uh, all of the, her fellow workers, some went actually to the funeral, uh, though it was in a time where most people were working. So I think all of us, there were a lot of us in that office, we went to the funeral home and we, we, you know, we signed the visitor's book. We went in. I went in and stood there with a friend of mine who was very psychic. And I said, he's still in the body. And he was. He was still in the body and was bewildered. Well, what was happening to him? So luckily we knew about yoga and we did what needed to be done and I don't want to dis describe uh, the, the, the process. That would take so long. And he was freed from his body. And I one time went into a cemetery. I'd already seen the earthbound uh, souls there. And uh, anyway, I did the work I could to see for some of them to be freed. But if they'd been cremated, there wouldn't have been any problem. Uh, you, that, that's uh, definitely so. So it's not uh, just abstract. It, re it really is something that matters. Of course, I am sure there are some people that they're so bound, you turn into ashes and they stay there. But then, well, after all, they're part of God, so they have that omnipotent will. Is the old meditation still used? Well, I don't. But... Uh, if you feel that is the highest and best for you, do it. Very, very definitely. But uh, I feel that Soham affects. You see, Om is the outer word. It's the projecting word by which the whole creation comes first causal, then astral, then physical. And of course, it's rooted in God. Therefore, the pranava, which means the life word, uh, is real and has tremendous benefit and tremendous elevation. But uh, its purpose is affinity with materiality. Its purpose is body inhabitation. I mean, of course, many other things. It works miracles. You work miracles with the pranava. Uh, but Soham is the summing up and let's go home after all this time kind of mantra. So that's what I prefer. Okay. How can we realize our true self, Swarupa, while our mind keeps drifting away from it, even when we're sincere towards our sadhana? By constant japa. That's the only thing that's going to do it. Constant japa and as much meditation as is sensibly practical. After all, we are living in the world and 18 hours a day meditation would sound nice, but we can't do it. And, uh, and again, yama, niyama, and don't forget that diet, both the physical diet and the mental diet, and then it will work. Are there group souls Actually, there are groups of souls. That is, for the way these subtle things happen in the creation. And uh, I just cannot pretend to myself that I understand all the ways, ins and outs. But for evolution, this is, for example, animals, like they'll have several uh offspring at one time. They may have eight, they may have a dozen. 
and and then they are associated with others who also are having more children. So the whole thing is there are overshadowing spirits, overshadowing consciousness, guardian spirits, actually, if you want to say guardian angels, that are there and they make a cohesion between these souls. These are usually lower evolved souls, you understand, insect life, animal life. Not so much with human, because in human level, individuality is, is, is the great lesson to learn and the great state to attain. But these souls, these beings are born and they have guardian spirits and the guardian spirits teach them what to do how to live. The animals in, in zoos often don't breed. That's because they have no guardian spirit there to explain to them what they would need to do. Birds fly south. You see that flock in a V shape going south. There is a guardian spirit there or a guiding spirit that is taking them or guiding them to where they need to go for the winter and that will guard guide them back compassion for animals is important and uh one one place we lived our ashram had a three and a half acre lake and about a mile or so there were one is one of these things called a swap meet where people come and bring all kinds of stuff and uh sell it and often they'll have animals there for you to buy kill and eat and uh, we went one time and we saw these ducks and we th i said just think they're good they could kill these animals so why don't we buy these ducks said, three or four why don't we buy them we'll take them back put them in the lake they're water birds they're meant to be there so we did it was amazing they were desperate for that water i mean when we let them out of the crate, they ran right into the water, and they spent nearly an hour immersing themselves again and again and again in the water. And uh, anyway, it got so that every time we went, we thought, well, we've got to rescue somebody. <laughs> so we ended up uh, with, with a goodly number of ducks on the lake, different kinds. And I was interested to see that when there got to be about a dozen of them, there was a spirit always moving with them. And I realized the spirit was supervising and, you know, talking to them, teaching them, training them. I was quite surprised it was always there with them. So a group of, there could be a whole group born in the same spot and so on and a group soul will look after them. Now, animals have a really interesting uh, ability. They can see spirits and, and understand nonverbal communication very well, whereas we're such clods, we don't. There's spirits all around us, we don't see them, and we don't get any message from them as a rule. But uh, they will guard and guide them. So I'd say a guardian spirit, a guiding spirit, maybe better than a group. The idea that there's some kind of a soul that inside has got all these beings uh, operating at once, that personally I don't believe, but I never found out that I'm the fountainhead of absolute truth, so as you think. But there are these souls, and you can talk to the guardian souls also. See, this is what they did in Fenhorn. They learned that there were even group souls for plants. And they um, uh, helped the plants to grow. And this is why they had fabulous gardens in the worst soil in, the, in, in Great Britain. Because the spirits helped out. Fenhorn was a wonderful, miraculous place. Well, it still exists. All right. Okay, here is someone who's very, very disturbed and very indignant. 
that I've written a book on the Tarot. Therefore, I get to have a commercial. Here you see is the book, How to Read the Tarot. Beautifully illustrated with color pictures of every single tarot card in the A.E. Waite deck. Waite was a great spiritual figure in England. He was actually an archdeacon in the Church of England. And he produced this tarot. There's a history to it, and I've been talking to you a long time on it, so uh, on other things, so I don't want to take it. It's, it's, it's told about in here. And the tarot is for diagnosis. You can use anything in a superstitious manner. But tarot is simply a diagnosis. It's like, how are things at this moment? And how are the, the tides on the subtle levels? How are they moving? What direction are they moving? And so on. You see, if you were to wonder, well, should I subscribe to some magazine? I wouldn't use this for anything as trivial as that, unless the magazine costs a lot of money. Uh, but you could. And it'll come out, and it won't be that the cards are saying, yes, do that, or no, don't that. The cards are saying, that isn't for you. Or, yes, this is a good time for you to learn it. You follow me? You're not... You should never do anything because divination tells you. But divination is important because, as I say, it is diagnosis. In the winter, you get up, you look out, it's snowing. Or maybe another time, it's raining. You look out, you see what the weather is, you think, well, I won't need a coat when I go out today. Or you say, I do need a coat when I go out today. Well, that's not idolatry. <laughs> and the world didn't talk to you and say, you must wear such and such a thing today. But you saw it, and what was appropriate, that's what you did. That is what divination is about. That's what astrology is about. Astrology is not about do this, don't do this. Astrology is the time is right for this, the time is not right for this. That's what it means. And... Uh, if you do work with the Tarot, and also this with astrology, if you feel that that's not the right thing, if you feel that when you looked at the cards and it said to do it, you feel, no, I don't think I should do it, or it told you not to do it, and again, it doesn't tell you not, but I've got to talk like this. Uh, and uh, not well, but I want to do it anyway. Then do it. Don't be a slave. This is a tool. It's not an oracle from God. It's diagnosis. Now, four times in all these years, I'm glad to say only four times I've not followed it. And all four times, I really regret it. It didn't destroy my life. I'm sitting here talking to you. But it was a grave mistake. Uh, uh, one time especially, because it had to do with health. And I thought, well, everybody else is saying this and that, and people are experts. And so I was told, stay away from this particular therapy. And... Uh, no, I did it anyway, and believe me, I suffered, and I, and I was harmed by what I was told not to do. Not that it wouldn't have been good for someone else, but I was told for me it wasn't good. So it's very important, but you're not a slave. And how does it work? How do your eyes work? How does your brain work? How is it your body is a living thing? Well, you don't, because you don't know that, you don't refuse to deal with it. You don't decide to just suddenly sit down and say, uh, well, there's a very interesting satirical short novelette. <clears throat> 
by uh, George Bernard Shaw called The Black Girl's Search for God. It's about an African girl that the missionaries have told her a bunch of stuff. And so she says one day, I'm going to go find God. And of course, they told her about God, and then they told her she couldn't find God. And she said, well, if, God can be, if God's real, I should be able to find him. And it's about her search. And what it is, it's about she encounters concepts of God embodied as people or as experiences. And she wisely keeps saying, no, there's something more than this. Well, there's one where uh, she finds the people who say, God is just mind. All is mind, you know. Uh, Christian science, new thought type of thought. And uh, everything is your mind. And so at one point she says, well, like, you know, for example, there's an alligator behind you with his mouth open. He's ready to, to snap you and whoosh up a tree. Up, they go up a tree. But the tree it doesn't have a lot of branches. It's more like a palm tree. So the person's up the tree. And she says, oh, excuse me, I was just teasing you. I didn't know you'd react so much like that. So come on down. And they said, well, it's impossible for me to have climbed this tree, says the person up the tree. It's not logical. So it's erroneous to think I'm up the tree. So if I agree to come down the tree, I'm compounding error. This is absolute Christian science talk and new thought type of metaphysical talk. I'm not exaggerating. I've heard him say things like this. So they, they wouldn't come down because they shouldn't have been able to have been up there. So <laughs> one does have to use, use their mind. But this is a great tool. Astrology is a great tool. It's difficult to find a good astrologer. Very difficult. And I would like to advise and tell you, if you find someone you think they're good, only ask about some minor things, things that may be significant, but it won't ruin your life or bring great damage if they give you wrong guidance. So do this about three or four times, and then you can ask the big things, but they need to be able to prove they can do it. And uh, believe me, we have had excellent astrologers it is truly phenomenal uh, their ability in in uh, in finding the future. One astrologer actually said to us, "We looking at a piece of property." He said, "Please be patient with the owner, whose behavior may seem kind of strange and erratic, but he he even knew it was a man is in such terrible pain." And he has to take strong painkillers, and it affects his judgment. Well, we asked a realtor about it and said, yes, he was a pilot, an air pilot, and his plane crashed, and that he was constantly in pain. And she said, I have a tremendous amount of difficulty trying to sell this property because of it. Well, now the astrologer told that. And he saw it from the astrological aspects. So, all right. We've taken up our time, but I have just two more questions. Uh, what do you recommend for good exercise adaptation for a yogi aspirant to have, attain better health, enhance meditation practice, and beneficial as we get up in aging? Well, again, diet is everything. As far as exercise, especially indeed when we're talking about people as we get older, well, frankly, it's just good to go. There are physiotherapists, and it's good to go and ask them about uh, routines. For example, we have a wonderful system here, the Presbyterian Health System, and they have um, a huge pool, heated pool, and... Uh, People go there and they take them through exercises and so on that they do when they're in the water and it's much easier to move around. That too is very good. Uh, you can find uh, sources, especially those who are like exercises for 
elderly people and so on, even on the internet. So that, but it should be by people who know what they're doing. We have right here in our little town, some people who are just very brilliant and very capable, and they have been very helpful to us. All right. Excuse me, I've got two more. All right, I thought I had only, I had three more. All right. Let's see. Can you direct me to the best available resources for learning the whole story of Christian's life? There is a book in Sanskrit. It's been translated into English. Uh, you'd need to search for one. I bought one in India. It's called Prem Sagar, P-R-E-M-S-A-G-A-R. Prem is love, and Saga, Saga, or Saga is ocean, means ocean of love. And that is an actual uh, ancient text uh, of the whole life of Krishna. Uh, if you can find with used books, and I've not checked to see whether um, Amazon might have it or not, there is an incredibly beautiful book called Sri Krishna, Lord of Love. Sri Krishna, Lord of Love. And uh, uh, by Baba, B-A-B-A, -B -A, Bharati, B-H-A-R-A-T-I. It was, the copy I have was printed in 1904 but it may have been reprinted, and it is exquisitely beautiful about the life of Krishna. But Prem Sagar is the most. Uh, Mahabharata tells us about Krishna, and I would just do a search about life of Krishna and texts of life of Krishna, because um, many things have been written uh, about that. All right. Could you please expand on Soham theurgy? Well, not exactly. I think what I wrote pretty well is about the way the theurgy is. You learn it by practicing. You learn by doing. Soham, Soham Sadhana, Soham Japa will teach you about itself and about its capabilities. I kind of tremble at saying that because there's always the people who or half cracked and they take and they run with it and God knows what mess they'll make of it. And I don't say this to offend you, but after all, there's quite a lot of people listening. And I expect there are a few loonies just by the law of averages. So um, just look at what I've said about that. And if you have a specific question, email me. So we can kind of tailor it to what... Uh, your ambition and your uh, experience and observation has been. And so we've gone over the time. I thank you very much for your questions. And I thank you very much for your patience in listening to me roam. I would love to say that I will be better in the future, but I'm positive I'm not going to be because after 83 years, I haven't managed to shut myself up so how are we going to do it now? So anyhow, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Namaste, namaste. I hope we'll get together next month.